Amen. Uh, as we close out Sunday evening in prayer and worship and celebration, God is worthy to be praised. Uh, I want to invite your attention back to Romans 3. We uh, looked uh, at uh, the latter part of verse number 22 and into 23. And I, I don't have it on the screen, but I'd like to read it for you. Uh, the latter part of uh, chapter number 3 and verse number 22. Uh, Paul says, for there is no difference. Your Bible says something like that? Oh, y'all not there yet? I said, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, I want to give you one more phrase. It says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in uh, Christ Jesus. I just want to pick back up on the note uh, that we left off on this morning in that uh, God had in his mind long before you and I were born how uh, he would redeem and save his people. Uh, didn't we study last year, Brother Barry, that God knows? God, God knows. The Bible teaches us that God knows better than we. God knows what we struggle with. God knows. He created us. Amen. And he knows. He knows it's hard to hold your tongue. He knows it's hard not to look twice. He knows it's hard. Amen. Uh, to always tell the truth even when you look bad doing so. He knows. Amen. And because of that, God had to do something, set something in place, set something up uh, where we could still be saved even though we're unworthy of it. I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, we are unworthy of the good things of God. We are unworthy of eternal life. We are unworthy of salvation. But God in his infinite wisdom and in his righteousness decided that he loved us enough to set up something whereby we could be saved even though we're not worthy. That's why we ought to thank God for Jesus Christ because the answer to our problem was Jesus and himself crucified. The answer to our problem was the gospel of Jesus Christ. The answer to our problem was his death, burial, and resurrection. He was the answer to our our problem. We had a problem with sin, didn't we? We had a problem with sin. And so uh, one of the problems that they had here in Rome and even in the Galatia church, they had the problem in Ephesian church. They had this problem uh, because uh, for thousands of years, God's people was Israel and he selected them. He hollowed them out. He blessed them. Uh, he decided to use their bloodline uh, as a means to bring about Jesus Christ. He decided to call them his people and in doing so he treated them differently than he treated people who were non-Israel so for thousands of years Israel was raised to believe that if they kept God's law because they were God's people that they would be saved and everybody else is unsaved Amen. So I want you to understand, for, for, for the Israelites, if you were not from Israel, you were just in trouble. God didn't have a relationship with you. God didn't, didn't love you. He didn't take care of you. Uh, if you were a Syrian, too bad. If you were Syrian, too bad. If you were a Chaldean, too bad. If you were Babylonian, too bad. If you were Greek, too bad. If you were uh, uh, from any one of the Greek cities, too bad. That was, that was uh, Israel's thinking. And God had to show them that even the Gentile people was on his mind when he was taking care of them. Oh, y'all missing this, y'all missing this. We were on the mind of God long before we even had a relationship with God. In other words, God was setting in place and putting in place and putting into actions those things that would prove his love to us even before we had a relationship with him. In other words, the Gentile people were on the mind of God even while he was uh, sp playing special favorites just to them. Which you may say, well, Tyson, I don't understand why that's important. Well, it's important for us to be saved, number one. That's what makes it important. Number two, it's important to understand that God really didn't want folk to be lost. He really wants everybody to be saved. So even when the, when the Gentiles outside of Israel were not being blessed by God, not being loved by God, not being guided by God, not being directed by God, he still in his infinite wisdom wanted their children to be able to come to him. And that's why the Bible says at just the right time. Christ died for the ungodly because it was about time, amen. It was time for us to see salvation, amen. It was time for black folks to be saved, amen. 
Amen. It, it, was, it was time for non-Jewish folk to be saved. Amen. Thank God that the time was right that his sin is only begotten son. So what we have, though, is we have people in the church now in Rome who believe that circumcision or their flesh or their ability to observe the law is what made them righteous. And so a Gentile person could not please God unless they exercised the same rules and observances that the law had. And people thought it was the law that made them right with God. But I want to show you something tonight, and it's just my one little point tonight. The law don't make you right with God. You are justified by grace through faith. That's what makes you enough. What happens is we put so much confidence in the flesh that we act like we don't need God for salvation. Oh, preacher, how can you say that? Well, when, when, when you start spouting off your resume as a means to prove to people that you do what's right and how you know the Lord, how God loves you, your resume don't save you. Amen, Walls. Your resume don't save you. Uh, I, I want you to know. Your, your, your resume, uh, as a matter of fact, don't really do much other than show us, you know, that you've been blessed, but it don't make you who you are. Amen. I know a lot of dummies got degrees. That don't mean they educated just because they know how to pass tests. Amen, Walls. Some of the smartest people living on the street. Amen. Some of the craziest people got all kind of money, all kind of possessions. That don't make you right because you got money or you got a degree. As a matter of fact, they say the smarter you are and the more genius you are, the crazier you are. Amen, Walls. Amen. So, so it's not about your resume. Now, God still has to take your little bit and add to it to make you enough. So I want to start with this tonight. It is true that God required circumcision as the sign of the covenant that he made with Abraham. For thousands of years, Israel practiced circumcision, taught and believed in circumcision, saw it as a mark that they belonged to God. God considered Israel his people, but what they failed to realize was that Gentile people belonged to God as well. And within the same promise to Abraham, the Gentiles also would be blessed. Now, we'll go into this more on, on, next, on next week. Uh, but I want you to understand that when God called uh, Abraham to step out on faith, Abraham didn't have the law of Moses. So you got to keep up with your chronological order in the Old Testament. We forget now Abraham is counted righteous because he left home by faith. Now, 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 if you ever on Jeopardy, I do this to my class at school. I say, listen, if you ever on Jeopardy and Alex Trebek asks you, amen, was Jesus a Christian? Tell them, no, Jesus was not a Christian. Jesus was Jewish. His followers are Christian. Jesus can't be a Christian because he can't be a follower of himself. All right. Israel, uh, 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 Abraham can't be Jewish. Abraham wasn't Jewish. Why? Because uh, the children of Israel is named after Abraham's grandson. Meaning Abraham was dead and gone before God called them specifically uh, to have that name. So, so if you have on Jeopardy, amen, and Alex Rebecca asked you, uh, was what, what religion was Abraham? Please don't say he was an Israelite. Amen. Uh, that, that would be like me uh, calling myself, uh, naming myself after my son. You can't, he got to be named after me. So you say, well, Tyson, why is that important? Well, the, the point of contention for the church in Rome uh, was that they were using the Old Testament to fight against Paul that they alone, through circumcision, was God's people. And Paul had to show him, listen, Abraham was only Abraham because God helped him, blessed him, and loved him. And Abraham only did what he did because he did it by faith. And, and it wasn't because uh, he was circumcised. As a matter of fact, uh, he was said to have been accounted with righteousness two chapters before he was even he was even circumcised. So Paul said it's not circumcision. It's not the flesh that makes you right with God. It's not your ability to keep the law. It's you are justified by faith. You believe in God and what he's done, and then God does the rest. Amen, amen. God no longer requires circumcision as the marker uh, for having a relationship with him. It is now done by faith. The law could not and it cannot make us holy. It could not and it cannot make us holy. It cannot justify us and make us right before God. It cannot save us from our sin. It really only makes us more aware of our sin. 
So I want you to think about it. When we think about the law of Moses, we think about the Ten Commandments. We think about all the rules in Leviticus and in Numbers where God said, don't do this and make sure you don't do that. And then there's a second reading of the Mosaic law in Deuteronomy. God said, don't do this and don't do that and don't do this and don't do that. Well, uh, it stands as it is. And when you sin against it, the law in and of itself cannot turn around and bless you to be enough. It only reveals he ain't no good. She ain't no good. So what you watch this. If you if you committed adultery, guess what? Ten commandments say you ain't no good. Amen. If you coveted your neighbor's wife, guess what the Ten Commandments told you? You ain't no good. Amen. Walls. If you if you lied, if you murdered, if you stole, the Ten Commandments basically said, <clears throat> you ain't no good. If you didn't honor your mother and father, which is the first commandment with a promise, guess what? You too ain't no good. Amen. And so when you committed sin against the law, all it determined was you ain't no good. But the question is, how can God have fellowship or communion with somebody who is a sinner? See, because God can't get with you. You know why he can't get with you? You ain't no good. I just told you the answer. Thank you. I thought somebody was listening. God, God can't have fellowship with a group of folk that ain't no good. And, and, and following the law only showed us that we ain't no good. So then how then are we going to have fellowship with God, the divine creator who makes no mistakes? How are we going to be one with him when we ain't no good? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question. How we're able to do it is that we are, our sins have been remitted because he got to do something with the sin. He, 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 the Bible says in times past, God just ignored it or he winked at ignorance. In other words, he treated those sins as something less worth. Guess what? Next year, y'all going to y'all gonna have to sacrifice to me and I'll forgive it. And the year after that, you're going to sacrifice, I'll forgive you. And the year after that, and it was just on and on again. But the sin never went away until Jesus came. And when Jesus came, the Bible says he is our once and for all sacrifice. What he did on the cross, that's it. That's the last sacrifice got to be made. And when you are covered in the blood of Jesus, God makes you enough. Now, I'm going to show you how this works. We have to be careful not to depend on resume because God is not depressed, impressed with your resume. God is not impressed with your resume. What God is looking for is faith. What God is looking for is obedience to the gospel. That's what God is looking for. So when we, when we have a tendency to lean on our resume as a means of saying how much we please God, you be careful about that. You be careful about that. So, so, so I want to show you a couple of scriptures and then I'm going to take my seat. Uh, the Bible says in our text right here, if you go up a little bit further uh, in, in Romans 3, starting at verse number 19, Paul says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. Watch this. The law only showed us how guilty we were. When you break it, guess what? You're guilty. Again, we ain't no good. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be made right or justified in his sight. So I want you to watch this. Paul says you can keep every single positively small, big, medium law in the Old Testament. It don't make you right with God because by the flesh shall no man be made justified. So I want you to watch this. You can't get all the answers right on the test. We need God's cheat sheet. Amen. And Jesus is our cheat sheet. I'm trying to paint a picture for you so you understand. Even if you study all your studies and get all your stuff right, at the end of the day, you still got an F. Amen. And we need somebody to take us from fail to A, and Jesus is the way. Oh, I think I ought to write that down. I think I can go back to rapping on that one. Amen. Amen. No, no flesh shall be justified. As a matter of fact, Paul echoes that in Galatians 2. Galatians 2 and verse number 14, it says, if you... Being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as Jews. Why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Now, the problem he was having in Galatia was that Peter was a little too timey with it. Uh, I love Peter because Peter makes mistakes, amen. And he's still uh, trusted by the Lord and loved by the Lord, but Peter made some mistakes. And one of the mistakes Peter made was that uh, when, the, when the brethren who came around, uh, well, when he was around the church, when he was around Gentiles, he would fellowship with them. Because he knew the truth, amen. He knew they was brothers and sisters in Christ. But then when there was the conservative people would show up who believed you had to be circumcised to be saved, then he act like he didn't know the Gentile people. 
Oh, y'all missing this. See, 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 there's some folk, there's some folk that, you know, you hang around, you talk, you fellowship with. Then there's other people, when they show up, then you don't act like you don't know them folks because they don't like them folks. And you want to impress the new people that walked in and you don't want to amen somebody. So, you know, in worship, uh, Sister, uh, Sister Glaze, you like to stand on your song and you might clap your hands and you might express your praise in worship. And, and so, and so you do that, you believe that and it's okay and everybody accept that and we love that and, 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 and we all good. And then when Sister so-and-so, that's conservative brother so-and-so, turn his lips up at that and he walk in and then you withhold your praise because you don't want, amen, you don't want him to think that you believe that because he might think less of you because that's what you believe. That's what Peter was doing. Peter literally would have fellowship with Gentile people. Then when the conservative Jews showed up in the church, then all of a sudden he act like he didn't know the Gentile people. Oh, y'all got to paint another picture. Okay, y'all didn't get that one. Uh, okay, so, 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 uh, uh, you have friends that you hang around that you do your dirt with. Amen. Amen. But you're not going to bring them around your church friends. Amen. Because you know your church friends going to look at how they act and say, how you know people act like that? And you don't want your church friends to know you that cool with these worldly kind of folk. Okay, y'all don't get that one. All right, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to paint pictures for you, and we're trying to keep it plain. I'm trying to make it plain. Listen, I want you to know that, that Paul accuses Peter uh, right here in Galatians 2. He said, now listen, you can't be two-faced. Either you believe Gentiles are saved or you don't. Which one is it? Don't be straddling the fence. Don't be choosing these people when it's convenient and act like you don't know them when it's not. Amen was. Matter of fact, Paul would say, here it is, you act more like a heathen by your actions, but yet you expect the heathen people to be like you. And that's where we are right here. That's why he says, if you being a Jew live in the manner or act like a Gentile and not as a Jew, why do you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus. Now, that heathen is show sure enough for heathen. And I made the point this morning that we both are heathens. Whether you Jew or Gentile, we all need the Lord. But our being made right is not by our ability to keep the law. Now, I'm going to show y'all what this looks like. Um, Brother Tyson, what you're trying to say? Well, if we make things to be rules where God don't make rules, we show sure enough in trouble. Now I want you to imagine, y'all know on the first of the year, the laws in our city and in our county and sometimes in our state and even our nations change on the first of the year. As a matter of fact, when it get to be about the last week in November, they start doing uh, ads on, you better know the new laws, because they come in effect January 1. They coming, right? Uh, we're going to have a cell phone. You, you got to use Bluetooth. We gonna, now you can't do this. Now you can't do that. And you got to keep up with the law. Now you know the bad part about it is what happens if you don't keep up with the law? When you break the law on January the 2nd, you still gonna get a ticket. Am I right about it? You still held responsible for it, right? Well, what happens in the world of religion if we always change in the law and don't tell nobody? Oh, I got quiet. I'm gonna say this again. What happens in the church when we start changing laws that God ain't have written in his book and we make life harder than it is and even what the Bible say? And people can't keep up with whether or not they please in God or not. As a matter of fact, instead of reading it for themselves, they got to check with you to make sure they doing this thing right. Amen, walls. So when we make law what God don't make law and then hold people accountable for how we believe the law teaches and not for what it says and means and, and means to us, then we make rules what God didn't make rules. And when we make rules what God didn't make rules and then make those obeying those rules as the litmus test for righteousness, there's some people who will never be able to pass the rule. Now, I'm going to make it real plain. I don't care. I'll stay in trouble, but I'm going to make it real plain. Uh, Y'all do know the world going to hell in handbasket, right? And people's morals have just gotten so lax. I mean, it used to be a day when Archie Bunker would say, girls were girls and men were men. 
you know, we didn't change all that, right? You got girl, girls dressing like boys, you got boys dressing like girls, and you know, you got boys, they got the earrings in there. They used to be the fight when I was a kid 25 years ago. We used to argue over that, and you know, the older brothers would talk about the boys with the earrings, and now everybody and their mama got an earring, amen. Used to be a day where that was just taboo, right? And, and, and then in the last few years, you know, these tattoos, you know, oh Lord, how we gonna do that? What we gonna do with that? Because I'll be honest with you, when you get a tattoo and then you get baptized, it don't wash off. I wish I had somebody that could say amen with me. Y'all do realize it don't wash off. So when they become a member of the church, see, they, they, they renewed on the inside. But on the outside, see, that stuff, don't, it don't come off. It didn't come off in the water. But you're still looking down your nose at him because it ain't washed off. Amen, walls. And we have said to see something wrong with your flesh. And see, I'm better than you because guess what? I don't have no ink on my flesh. But the person who does, guess what? According to your rules, can never be saved because they got markings on their arms that ain't going to come off. No flesh shall be justified. Watch this. You're, you better be glad that your body is not going to be determinant of what gets you in the glory. Because somewhere down the line, we all sick with something. And we're all imperfect with something. Am I right about it? So let's go on and finish the thought. The Bible says here uh, that, no, that no man will be uh, justified by, faith, uh, by, by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even if we believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I want to end with this. Since we are justified by faith and not by works of the law, this places, watch this, all people on equal footing. Now let's go back to resume. If we base it on our resume, our spiritual resume, then we don't stand on equal footing because we can start to make difference between one another. So the first thing we do is, well, you're a member of the church, but we ain't seen you in years, so you ain't faithful. Therefore, you're not as good as a Christian as I am because I come to church every Sunday. Okay, y'all don't make that distinction. That's all right. All right. Uh, when I was a kid, the preacher used to say that the young people need to sit down front. And the reason why they need to sit down front is because uh, the closer to the back door you sit, the easier it is for you to leave out and lead the fellowship of the saints. So he would literally, from the pulpit, tell all the young people, y'all come down front, see? Y'all come down front, sit down front, because we don't want nobody sitting in the back. And I, I understand, as a preacher, I would much appreciate if y'all would sit down front, but your righteousness is not based on where you sit. Now, now I might ask you, could you come down front, but I ain't going to put you out of heaven, because you don't. Y'all see the difference? All right, all right. Not only that, not only that, but then we got the difference between the folks who sit in the front and the folks in the back, and then we differentiate between those who come to Bible school and those who don't. Y'all know y'all cool because y'all back at five o'clock. But the rest of them heathens, we don't see where they are. We had we had room full of folk this morning. Where they at? At home watching the game. Amen. Y'all don't want to laugh. This is the time you can laugh. Y'all here. Amen. Amen. We differentiate that, 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 that we, we, we are the righteousness of God because we have passed the resume. But then everybody in here ain't equal. And for those of you who got public struggles, now y'all going to sit over there. And, and, and y'all go sit, go sit away from me because, see, I, I keep my stuff wrapped up tight. No, you just put on a bigger mask and keep it hidden. Can we be honest with ourselves? But we'll differentiate between those who always have it together and those who ask for prayer every Sunday. Right. Amen, Walls. I said that, Gordon. I'm talking about you. That's right. We, we, we'll look down our nose at folk because they ask for prayer a lot. What you mean is wrong to ask for prayer a lot? We all need to be on the front row every Sunday. We differentiate. Y'all see what happened? All right, now watch this. You're, you're, you're a good brethren if you lead in service. And we consider leadership standing right here. This leadership. Now, you ain't got to lead your family, but if you pass out a tray, that makes you a leader. How did this make you a leader? But see how we differentiate? And, and, and watch this. The more important you are, the closer you work to the middle. <laughs> you know, basket guys don't really do much. Then it's like special teams. You, you the punt team kicker, you know, then you the tackle, and then you the guard. And then the guy who's standing in the middle, see, he the quarterback. 
and he more spiritual than the rest of these jokers up here. And you're really doing something if they let you stand on the big mic. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to show y'all where we do this today. Righteousness, now that brother led main prayer. He got to be doing something. I thought I had arrived when I started preaching on Sunday morning. Lord have mercy. As if the word was more powerful in the a.m. versus being preached in the p.m. Don't we differentiate? Don't we set ourselves aside? And then once you finally attain to, to the status of the preacher, then we got different levels of that. Amen. Now, I'm going to just be honest with you. Brother Tyson went to school. He was hard going to school. But God blessed me to go to school. But I dare you come up to me and ain't spent a day in school, ain't preached but two sermons, and you're going to check me about something I said. I dare you to do it. Oh, see, y'all act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Now, you all know we do that. Be, I, be, look, tell the truth, shame the devil. We different as if, as if I got all the word, all there is to know and know everything, and you can't tell me otherwise. We differentiate. Whether or not you got your own church or not. Amen. We differentiate. Listen, I was Brother Curl's assistant for 12 years. I would go places. They say, oh, you're the assistant. Oh, okay, that's what it means. I'm sorry. I didn't. Amen. One, one, one brother told me I was the assistant. Amen. Y'all going to get that on the ride home. Listen, listen. As if my ministry was demeaned or didn't mean it, we differentiate. Y'all see how we do that? So, based on longevity, resume. Based on how you look, resume. Based on where you been, resume. Based on where you went to school, resume. Based on who family you married into, hmm, resume. But based on what family you come from, resume. Paul says, no, we all on equal foot. No, no, ain't no first family in the church. We all the first family. That's what Paul says. We all the first fan. Ain't, ain't no special folk. Amen. Ain't, ain't no holy seats. Amen. Amen. We, we all the church in here. Amen. That's what Paul said. So, so with that being on equal footing, faith in Christ uh, 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 it basically means that the, the, the burden of keeping the law comes to an end. Because following it to a T still don't make us enough. So we should no longer seek justification by the works of the law. And then be uh, uh, subject by the law. Rather, we should seek to be justified by Christ, whose grace covers our iniquity and does away with our sin. The law don't do away with it. So I got to show y'all that this next week. But I want to give you this last slide here. We're going to be done in two minutes, I promise you. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 1. Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now I want to show y'all what this looks like. Remember a couple weeks ago we were in the story in Luke 15 of the shepherd and the sheep. That was last week. Y'all remember that? All right. And in the shepherd and the sheep, uh, the Bible tells us that the shepherd finds a sheep and he puts the sheep on his shoulders doing what? Rejoicing. Remember that? He rejoices. And then I made the point last week that he's now got to carry the sheep back home. He's got to carry the sheep back home, meaning the sheep no longer walks. Sheep don't have to walk on his four legs. He don't have to worry about it. The shepherd's got it. The shepherd's going to carry the burden. The shepherd is going to put the heavy sheep on his shoulders and walk that sheep all the way back to the house. Okay. Now, we made the point that when you wander away from God and the Lord come looking for you, he's he not really asking you by your own strength to get home. Remember now, Jesus is the good shepherd. And he's going to put you and your burdens on his shoulders and then he gonna walk us oh y'all missing this i said he gonna walk us back home now now i want you to watch this before you come to christ you are that sheep that has wandered off but when you find the lord you got to submit to him well tyson what is submitting to the lord is allowing yourself to be carried on his shoulders well, preacher, I don't understand what you're saying. I understand we walk with God and that he's leading us. Well, I want you to understand that Jesus is actually carrying our burden so we don't have to carry it. 
So he puts us on his shoulders and walks us home. He carries the burden you and I cannot carry. Now I want you to watch this. <clears throat> when we establish our own form of righteousness, what we're saying is, God, we know how to please you and we got it. And I would much rather, based on my own sense of righteousness, do what I think is right, regardless of what your words say. And that's the reason why there's some of us who can't accept God's forgiveness because we messed up so bad and we feel so much guilt. How in the world can God still love us when we did these awful things? And so we will not accept God's salvation because we want to walk home by ourselves. God never designed this thing for you to walk on your own two feet and by your own strength. He designed this thing for his son to carry our burden so you and I ain't got to walk home. He came for us to carry us home. And that's why we raise up our voice and sing, swing low. Sweet chariot coming forth, not so I got to walk home, not so I got to get there by my own strength, but that I might be carried by the son of the living God. So I want you to watch this. When you establish your own form of righteousness, you're telling God, I'd rather walk. I'd rather walk instead of allowing the blood of Jesus to carry you home. Let me tell you something. It sounds too good to be true, don't it? That's the reason why we're scared of it. It sounds too good to be true. Guess what? All you got to do is have faith and obedience to the gospel God or take care of the rest. Let him carry you home, which means you might have to go places you don't want to go, but as long as you know the end game is to get home, I'll go with you through the fire. And if God's carried on his shoulders and you see a wall coming up and you wonder whether or not he's going to scale it, God might kick through the door in the wall and walk right through it. But when you're riding on his shoulders, you don't care because he know where he's going. Y'all see that? All right, last little scripture here is found uh, in, in Philippians 3 uh, where the... The people of God um, are fighting over circumcision. Again, the argument is over circumcision. And, and Paul is so disgusted with them by this point. Uh, he is really just turned off. But it, and he calls them uh, dogs, literally. I mean, this man called folk dogs. And he wasn't talking about what's up, dog. He, he basically said, you ain't nothing but a dog. I mean, this was derogatory. He says, beware of dogs. Beware of eagle work, workers. Beware of the mutilation. Now, King James Version says, beware of those of the circumcision. In other words, people who taught and believed that circumcision was the way that you please God to be saved. He said, beware of those people. For we, talking about the church, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. In other words, we don't put our faith in our resume. And then you know what Paul does? He gives us his resume. So look at what he said. I'm going to read the resume to you. He says, that if anyone thinks he should have confidence in the flesh, it's me. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day. So what y'all arguing over? I got that. Did it. He says, I'm of the stock of Israel. So I'm an Israelite. I'm not a convert to Israelism. I, I, I come from the tribe of the family of Benjamin. He says, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. I kept the law so much, I squeezed the brown juice out of a penny keeping the law so much. That's what Paul said. He said, concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. He said, concerning the righteousness, which is of the law, I was blameless. Paul said, I kept every rule. He says, but what things were gained to me? These I have counted for loss for Christ." Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found positional now in him. Watch this now. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. So hold on, Paul. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You went to school. Mm-hmm. You was born in the right family. Mm-hmm. You never broke the law. Mm-hmm. You persecuted the church. You show us how much you love Israel. Mm-hmm. You did all that. You got the resume. Mm-hmm. Paul says, I counted for loss. And I don't depend on that for my righteousness. I depend on the righteousness, which is in Christ. Watch this, which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness, which is from God by faith. So I want you, I want you, I want y'all to watch this, brothers and sisters. What we then, what we then end up doing is when we when we put our stock in our resume, we are telling God we don't need his grace. Now you be careful telling God you don't need his unmerited favor. 
And that's the reason why this morning we tried to make the point that no matter where you fall along the line of how big and bad you are, you still need the grace of God. Now that's what God's people look like. Next week we'll talk about God's proof, God's price and God's plan in the coming weeks. My brother says, I want you to watch this. <clears throat> God loved us so much. And I know I say that every Sunday, and it's like a broken record, but I want you to understand, God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. And the shedding of blood on the cross of Calvary allows us to be made right when we're obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to submit to water baptism, which places us in Christ. And that's what makes you enough. And yes, there's going to be times when you mess up again. But you know what God got for you when you do? Some more love. Amen. Some more grace. Some more mercy. Some more blood of Jesus, which is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God wants you to get back on your horse. Get back on his shoulder. And let's keep going home. We should tell us, brothers and sisters, that we have a great safety net. And that safety net is being in Christ. And if you're here tonight and you don't have a safety net, you don't want to meet God without Jesus. The Bible says he is the propitiation of our sin. He is our atoning sacrifice. When we stand before God with all the deeds that we did or did not do and all the laws that we broke, the only way God is not going to hold them against us is when we are found covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the greatest gift God has ever given given to us. If you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, it looks like just home folk tonight, but if you're not a Christian, you need to be one tonight. You know why you need to be one? Because the Lord is calling you. He wants to carry you home, but you've got to submit to what he wants you to do. And it starts by coming to him by faith. Remember now, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Because you've got to believe that he is and his reward of those that diligently seek him. Bible teaches us that once we hear and believe we ought to repent, change our mind, change our mentality and allow God to have the full reign in our life. Confess with your mouth that he's the Christ. The Bible says we submit to water baptism where we are washed clean and we come up new creatures in Christ. If you hear you're already a child of God, listen, God knows. When you mess up, God knows. When you want to do right and you still do wrong, God knows. And when you come up short, you got to ask God, Lord, I need you to make me enough. So with all your trials, all your tribulation, all your doubt, you ever have something where you've been praying on it so hard, you got the bubble guts, you're worried about it, then God come through with the blessing, and then you kick yourself for being so worried about it because you should have just believed God was going to take care of it anyway? Oh, I'm the only one to do that. I'm sorry. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Y'all act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Listen, sometimes, even in our best intentions, we fail God because we fail to believe that he can. Amen. For some reason, we think he's not going to come through, even though he's come through 10 times out of 10. We have a, still have our, our flesh won't allow us to do it. We just think he won't answer this one thing. And so we get nervous and get scared and start to doubt. And God said, I had the thing the whole time. What you worried about? Wasted all that rest. You could have got a good night's sleep the other night, but you stayed up. If you're here tonight and you need to renew your zeal, faith, trust, and love in the Lord, we beg you to do so right now, Brother Barry. He together we stand. keeps blessing me over. Doesn't he bless us over, over and over again? Over and over, over.